Um, all right, thank you everybody for joining us today in this uh, virtual brain map. Uh, so we have the pleasure to have Simon Aikov here. Um, thank you, Simon, for joining us. Uh, he's a full professor at the Institute of System Neuroscience at the Heinrich Hein University of Düsseldorf and the director of the Institute of Neuroscience and Medicine at their research centrum of Ulich. Uh, he's also a visiting professor at the Chinese Academy of Science Institute of Automation. He works at the interface between your anatomy, data science, and brain medicine, and he aims to obtain a more detailed characterization of the organization of the human brain as, and its in, inter-individual variability in order to better understand its changes in advanced age as well as neurological and psychiatric disorders. This goal is pursued by the development and application of neural analysis tools and approaches for large-scale multimodal analysis of brain structure, function, and connectivity, as well as by machine learning uh, for single subject prediction of cognitive and social affective traits, and ultimately precision medicine. So thank you, uh, Simon, for joining. Um, just uh, before actually starting, um, I'm going to say a few tips out like uh, Zoom. Uh, so Simon um, is uh, happy to receive questions uh, during his talk. So if you have any question during his talk, um, you can write it on the key question and answer uh, box. Please don't write them in the chat because it's hard to follow um, all the possibilities of questions. So uh, you have a Q&A uh, box on the bottom of your screen, use that. Um, also, if you like to use your voice, uh, feel free to send, me a, a, send us to the panelists uh, a chat um, and you can, make, uh, you can say your name and that you want to ask a question with your voice and we can unmute you. So um, I think that's everything. And so with that, uh, Simon, uh, welcome and thank you for sharing. Thank you very much for the introduction. Um, thank you very much for the invitation. It's a pleasure to virtually present some of our thoughts, some of our ideas, some of our work and I'm uh, looking forward to the discussion, as already mentioned. Um, I'm happy to also take questions during the presentation. So one of the most striking features of the human brain that I think all of you have encountered when you do any sort of neuroimaging data analysis is a big inter-individual variability, variability in terms of brain structure, brain function and connectivity. And one of the key goals, not only of our work, but I think of much of systems neuroscience is trying to understand how aspects such as age, gender, genetics, but also for example, experience, health and lifestyle influence and probably to a certain degree determine variability on the neurobiological level. At least as important though, is then the link between brain variability on one hand and inter-individual differences in phenomenological traits. So be it cognitive performance, socio effective functions, or in particular also psychopathology. So one of the key questions that has been driving systems neuroscience and neuroimaging from its very beginning is how do brains between patients of neurological or psychiatric disorders differ from healthy subjects. Now, we can ask whether this is really the best way to actually gain better understanding of inter-individual differences and brain structure function relationships. Let us just take a little step back. What is the standard approach? The standard approach that uh, we have all been following for the last more than two decades is to recruit a sample of patients and a sample of controls, for example, and then test for differences, group differences in a particular trait. Now, this kind of figure, I think all of you have seen many times in papers, and I think virtually all of you have also produced these kind of figures. I certainly have. So, this is a highly significant P less than 0 0.001 
difference between patients and controls in a particular measure. If you look at the standard error, this underlines the high significance and um, well, this is really a, a question. Is that then a good biomarker? Now, in a real world talk, I would uh, ask for a raise of hands who thinks that this could be a viable biomarker. I'm not doing it here, but rather move on to a second figure that shows exactly the same data, exactly the same data, just plotted in a more honest fashion. So what do we see? We see that even a measure, a potential biomarker that is highly significantly different between patients and controls actually can show widely overlapping distributions. And hence, it becomes, I think, quite obvious that any single feature rarely allows inference on the individual level. The very same holds also for continuous phenotypes. So here I use the dichotomous one, patient versus controls. And uh, for the, in the interest of time, I didn't show the other example, but it's basically the very same thing. If you measure brain volume, brain activity, brain connectivity, any single voxel region connection is highly unlikely to actually allow inference, individual inference on a given subject. There's also a flip side to that. And the flip side is that the absence of a univariate effect that does not necessarily mean that we are all lost. Now, this is a toy example here. Um, uh, two groups of people, basketball players and sumo ringers. And you can see that these two groups are not significantly different from each other in terms of their height. Likewise, the two groups are not significantly different from each other in terms of their weight. And last but not least, both measures are highly correlated. Now, this should remind virtually any of you of some studies that you've recently done or read. It's really what we are facing all the time. There is some trend towards a group difference in a bunch of measures and they're all highly intercorrelated, but where do we find our biomarker here? Now, the interesting thing is that on one hand, as I've shown in the last slide, a highly significant group difference on a single parameter does not indicate any discriminability. On the other hand, if you have different features, different parameters that are both not significantly different, they may jointly actually allow a very good discrimination between, in this case, two different groups. So that basically means that multivariate patterns can greatly increase predictive power. However, they do come at a very big risk and that risk is overfitting. Putting it very bluntly, if you have more features than you have subjects, you can always find for that particular group a perfect discrimination. Well, obviously, I guess uh, that should be quite clear that this then is overfitted and only specific to that particular group. So how to remedy that? The key is to take a different perspective on how we actually ask our questions. Classical statistics is basically asking whether the difference in the mean of the patient population and the mean of the control population is surprisingly big. Clinical questions but honestly, most research questions actually implicitly or explicitly focus on new cases. I do not want to know whether in that particular group of schizophrenia patients and controls, there was a difference. I wanna know, can I make an inference about a new case that I have not seen yet? And we can answer that 
by basically taking the data that we have, training a model that allows you to distinguish patients from controls, or a model that allows to predict a certain continuous trait. And then we need new cases, new cases that the model has not seen before, that were not part of the training group. And then we can test whether or not the model that we fitted on one group of subjects actually generalizes to that new independent sample. Now, we are in the very lucky situation as a field that increasingly large, and if you look at the UK Biobank, very large cohorts become available. So this has spurred the research, the quest for these kind of machine learning based biomarkers of brain variability and brain behavior relationships in health and disease. Now there's one caveat that needs to be remembered, even though it's highly uncomfortable. Even the largest of our samples are actually rather small relative to the number of features. I'll give you a very simple example. If you do a standard voxel-based morphometry or cortical thickness analysis, you easily end up with a number of voxels or vertices that widely outnumbers the number of subjects even in the UK Biobank. In fact, a standard um, VBM analysis roughly comes out at about 400,000 voxels. UK Biobank has 40,000 subjects. So even in the advent of now substantially large studies, we are still not at the position that much of machine learning in other fields is in, which is that we actually have more data, more observations, more subjects than we have features. So the key argument that I will elaborate on in the rest of my talk is that pursuing machine learning for brain behavior associations in a naive fashion is not only unclever because we get into the case of large number of features versus this relatively small number of subjects, but it also ignores basically any knowledge that we've gained from the last roughly 150 years of neuroscience. So I will advocate an approach where we actually start and try to integrate previous knowledge on brain organization into these machine learning pipelines. And we'll start with looking at the first fundamental principle of brain organization, and that's regional segregation. It's easy to forget, but important to remember that we do not have 400,000 nodes of brain variability, even though we have 400,000 voxels. But rather, we know that the brain is regionally segregated. So different parts of the brain do different things. And these parts, the cortical areas, then constrain brain structure, function, and connectivity. Importantly, though, they only have a loose relation to macroanatomy. Here are some references for those of you that want to go deeper into the de details of brain parcellation and cortical cartography. For now, the key takeaway is we do not need to put ourselves into the problem of having 400,000 voxels for only, let's say, 1,000 participants, but we rather can work with a more limited number of brain areas that then gives us a much better relationship between the number of features, now the number of areas, relative to the number of subjects. How does that look like in a somewhat schematized pipeline? We obviously first have to have a reasonably large number of subjects. 
One of the questions that is always coming up here, what is reasonably large? The answer is not surprisingly, because that's the answer to most questions, it depends. But I would argue that anything less than a few hundred subjects is probably putting you on very insecure footing in terms of machine learning and individual prediction. These subjects are then scanned and pre-processed, which actually is in itself a very large and uh, very important topic because we have to acknowledge that in the domain where we have several hundreds or even thousands of subjects, the classical way of organizing your data, of running your analysis does not work anymore, but we actually need a proper data management and automated processing system. But that's a topic for a different session. Now, the key idea is that we can now reduce these kind of 400,000 individual voxels that we see um, in the VVM image by using a brain atlas, such as the Schäfer atlas I'm showing here, and then basically just represent individual anatomy by the volume of a few hundred rather than a few hundred thousand features. We can then subject these to machine learning algorithms that then try to, in the end, provide a mapping between that input space and the target space, which could be age, gender, clinical condition, and so on. And then we have to reevaluate or have to evaluate it in new, previously unseen subjects. The first example that I'm going to spend a bit of time on because it's really been one of the most uh, productive and fruitful test bets for these kind of methods is the prediction of individual age from T1 MRI. Now there are two reasons to focus on age prediction. One is, it's actually one of the fields where we have a lot of data readily available. If you look at the current landscape, you see that more and more data is shared, which is, I think, not only good, but essential. But the phenotypical characterizations vary a lot. So age is one of the few information you really can get from several thousands of subjects. The second is that uh, brain age, and I will show that in about a slide, actually does have some very interesting properties and allows some interesting neurobiological insights. What you will see now here on the left is on the x-axis, the chronological age of about 6,000 subjects. On the y-axis, you see the age as estimated from a single T1 MRI scan. And as you can see across the whole lifespan, we can actually predict age very well from structural neuroimaging. I should add that this is data from dozens of different centers, different scanners. So um, in spite of all of this confounding variability, we can actually estimate individual age with a mean average error of about four to five years. Now, in healthy populations, and not surprising, the mean brain age deviation so the difference between age as predicted by the MRI scan and the actual chronological age is centered around zero. So on average, people are estimated as old as they really are, but there are some people who have a positive brain age deviation. A positive brain age deviation means your brain looks older than you actually are. And you have some people that have a negative brain age deviation. So a negative deviation means your brain looks actually younger than you are. And what happens if we go to clinical populations, um, if we, for example, investigate patients with mild cognitive impairment, we see an average increase in brain age deviation of about roughly six to seven years. If we then go to patients with Alzheimer's disease that becomes even stronger. So on average, they're about 10 years 
older, or their brain look about 10 years older than they really are. So this is data that we published in uh, 2018. And one of the things that I'm actually quite happy about is that we could more recently replicate it in a study that's just been online in, in human brain mapping. So again, we had subjects uh, that were normal controls. We had MCI patients and Alzheimer patients. And again, we replicated basically the finding. But that was actually not the key aim of that study. But rather, we wanted to look at the effects of sleep-related breathing disorders, mainly obstructive sleep apnea. These have been discussed as a potential risk factor for dementia, cognitive decline, and then MCI and Alzheimer. So we were asking the question, do patients with sleep breathing disorders show an increased brain age? This is the data for the healthy controls. Replicating the previous work, mean brain age deviation was zero, and there was no difference between patients with and or subjects with and without sleep disorder breathing. We replicated the finding for MCI. The effects were a little bit smaller than in the previous studies. So we found a brain age advancement of about four years in this case. Again, we found no effect of sleep-related breathing disorders. And finally, if we look at the data from the Alzheimer patients, we again replicated the previous effects with a slightly smaller effect size, so about nine years advancement. And again, no effect of sleep disordered breathing. And also, I think it's obvious from the figures, but it's worthwhile to state, there was no significant interaction between brain age advancement and sleep breathing disorders. Why do I want to highlight this study and what does it sort of show and give us beyond the actual, I think, very interesting effect? It also shows that there is a very good case for combining replication studies with further directions. So the key point here on that, the key aim of that study was to investigate a, a sleep disorder breathing, but we found a null effect. So if we would only have looked, let's say, at the leftmost bars, doesn't help the controls, then we would not have known if this is an effect of our algorithm, just not working, not working properly, or if that's a true neurobiological null finding. Now, by combining a replication of the well-established effect that you have an advanced brain age in MCI and in Alzheimer with the null effect, I think we can add more confidence to this null effect. And I'm seeing one question in the Q&A. If that person wants to unmute and ask the question, I'm super happy to answer. Um, Randy, I think I just unmute you if you want to go ahead and ask your question. Hi, Simon. It's Randy Gallup. Just asking, when you're um, able to distinguish the healthy controls from MCI and Alzheimer's disease patients looking at brain aging, are you able to uh, tell if there's any regional specificity to the, where those differences arise? Or is it just a, you get you know, a binary, different, not different? Well, the answer is probably both, to be honest. Um, so on the, this level, we, can o we only get one predicted age per subject, and then we can look at the difference between the predicted age and the actual chronological age. The regional specificity would need to come earlier at the level of the model, because uh, remember, we are looking at multivariate effects, so you cannot say uh, this region allows a distinction. In fact, we try to look at that. The answer is no brain region can actually univariately distinguish the groups from each other. Um, now, the thing is, the model, though, um, or a phrase is slightly different. So depending on how much sparsity you enforce in, on the modeling side, you can actually get down to a relatively small number of regions that 
basically um, drive or determine the prediction. This does allow you to make some more regional inference, but it usually comes at the price of the model being less precise. So in terms of brain age, we actually played a lot with that. And we can really see if we enforce more and more sparsity on the model level, basically asking the algorithm, use as few regions as possible to predict age. Then we do actually see that the, um, the accuracy of the prediction starts to get worse and worse. So it seems like we are actually looking at rather distributed effects. Um, and so this is going to be a back and forth in the future from uh, optimizing on the model side, in particular optimizing for sparsity, and on the interpretation side. Um, uh, Simon, I have another question. Let me... Sure. Let me unmute. Um, Hamid, do you want to go ahead and ask your question? Um, hi, uh, thank you, Simon. I just said that maybe it's not very constructive for the time for the presentation, but I mean, you were just uh, pointing out to the cons regarding using bar plots and uh, the results here, you're using bar plots. <laughs> so I was wondering, it would have been nice if you showed the scatter plots because some of the means here are also very close. So it's a bit, uh, uh, yeah, that was just my I agree. Actually, I sorry agree. To, sorry uh, to interrupt. No, I think it's a, it's a good point. It's, it's, it's true. Um, I think it, it's also illustrating how deeply ingrained this kind of presentation is, uh, is, is in us, to be honest. Um, and indeed, what we see, well, I can, you can just skip to the next slide, that we are uh, doing a more honest presentation. I'm just showing the whole slide and I then walk you through it. Uh, so in, in fact, thank you for making almost a perfect transition to the next slide. Um, uh, perfect, thank you very much, Simon. Where we actually uh, had a look at, at Parkinson's disease so here we had two cohorts, um, one, one local one, and the other is the PPMI data set, both having controls and patients. Uh, now there's a, a rather big technical backstory to that, that I would have loved to present at OHVM at a poster, um, as you can see below. Uh, we will probably, well, we will not present it as a poster, but I hope I can present it online um, during the, whatever the meeting is gonna be like. So the key idea technically here was that we want to build a age prediction model that is site agnostic so that we can really use on any new site that's coming in. So what we did, and that's the uh, middle top um, tile of that figure, is to use a whole range of large cohorts that all had their peculiarities in terms of age distribution, in terms of sex distribution. And then we basically fitted a stratified ensemble model that um, is based on a lot of variable data, but explicitly tries not to capture any of the bias that is in the training data sets. I'm happy to talk more about that, uh, about that later. But if we fit that model on all of these different cohorts, and then apply it, and that's sort of the top right bar. If you apply it to the healthy controls from both uh, cohorts, the, the PPMI is slightly darker and the local is slightly lighter, we can see that on the healthy cohorts, we can predict individual age quite well. Again, mean average error about four and a half years. Now, if we look at the Parkinson's patients from either cohort, that's below, and I think you can see my uh, mental evolution. Um, so the one paper has just been published. That's what we are writing up at the moment. We are moving away from the bar plots. Um, and to be honest, I've, it's not the first time I've heard the comment. And if you see that, you see two, three very interesting aspects. One is brain age is on average advanced in Parkinson's disease. That's not particularly surprising because it's a neurodegenerative disorder. Um, but it's nice to show that indeed, on average, patients with Parkinson's have an advanced brain age. We also see that this is not true for each and every patient. 
In fact, there are some patients that have an uh, apparent brain age that is younger than the actual chronological age. There's a lot of reasons for why that may be the case. One is, we have to be honest there, it could be technical. Basically, these could be uh, the limits of the accuracy of our model. And the second is, and that gets unfortunately way more complicated, we know that there is an interaction between protective factors, education, for example, genes and um, disease. And so it could very well be that there are some people that have a disease process that are Parkinsonian patients, but even when the, age pro uh, the disease process has kicked in, they've been starting from such a high level, such a protected environment, so to speak, that even in spite of the disease process, their brain still looks younger than they actually um, chronologically are. Last point, we also see that the uh, advancement is higher in, Ach in the local cohort, Aachen and Düsseldorf, than the PPMI database. And uh, that's actually a factor that can be very well explained because PPMI is a progression initiative. Uh, most of the patients are fairly early in the disease course, whereas most of our local patients are more advanced. And in fact, we do see a correlation between brain age advancement and disease duration. The longer disease duration, the more brain age advancement. We see a correlation with disease severity. The more affected, the more brain age advancement. And we see a relation to cognitive status. The worse the cognitive status, the more brain age advancement. And there's another question. Um, Livia, you can talk. Um, hi. Uh, um, my question was actually, uh, for such cases, can we associate uh, individual uncertainty and uncertainty measure uh, for the prediction of brain age? Um, can we theoretically, yeah. or do we have a working model that is really doing it? The answer on the first side is yes. The mm -hmm. answer on the second side is no. It's, we are still working on that. Oh, I see. So is there any, um, I don't know, theoretical complexity well, there's, there's, that you see? Or, uh, you can do that. The one is that you actually have per se a model that has an uncertainty component in it. Mm -hmm. The second, that's where actually this study is particularly interesting. This is an ensemble prediction. So mm -hmm. we can basically then use the, um, the results from the individual weak learners in the ensemble to build a distribution of predictions. So we can basically bootstrap from the, from the weak learners. And they can you know, get, also get us an uncertainty estimate. Okay, yeah, thank you. Personally, I'm, I'm quite intrigued by the second option. Theoretically, uh -huh. it's really nice. Uh -huh. um, practically, I have up to now, I have to say, mm, not as nice as I want it to be. <laughs> okay, yeah. Um, thank you. This is uh, now moving sort of beyond the, the brain edge field uh, so to examples of trying to move beyond a skilled radiologist. Why the skilled radiologist? Well, for those of you that work clinically or work with clinicians and have seen radiology reports on really any neurodegenerative patient, basically any neurological patient, the first comment in the radiology com uh, section is always, uh, in the report is always, looks age equivalent, looks slightly pre-aged, looks severely pre-aged. So really, we could argue that uh, predicting brain age is just quantifying and objectifying what radiologists are doing anyways. So um, here are two examples that where we thought like, well, can we move beyond that using exactly the same machinery and pipeline that I've just exemplified? And uh, this is the first case. 
So if you ask a radiologist, tell me whether that's a male or a female brain, um, they can only guess. Well, I've met one charlatan once on a podium discussion that uh, claimed that he could easily spot the male and the female brain by looking at an image. Um, if you do it on a, uh, we did a sort of slightly informal surgery survey here with some radiologists, it's impossible. Actually, if you use um, these kind of multivariate patterns, you can easily get to about 90% accuracy. In fact, that's slightly older version of the results. We can uh, probably get up to roughly 95% accuracy telling if somebody is a man or a woman. And um, that's sort of where we are really heading. Can we predict future events? So anything you can uh, theoretically also assess at the moment, if you can read that out from the brain, that's intriguing because you don't need um, a huge array of different tests, but you can basically scan once and then get the results for all tests you have a model for at the same time from the brain image. But the, I think the holy grail and where we really need to and want to move towards is predicting the future. And here's an, an initial example where we tried to predict outcome of a thinnitus therapy. It was an add-on to a clinical trial. And um, as you can see, uh, we have rather biased outcomes. So uh, most people did not benefit and we could identify them quite well, but we could also identify those that actually benefit fr benefited from the theory with a reasonable accuracy. Just skipping that in the interest of time. So just to wrap up the first big part of the talk, the ultimate goal is to use the big data sets that are being increasingly made available to then build multivariate models, individual predictors of brain behavior relationships and if we do that in a naive fashion, we are overwhelmed by the number of features. However, we can introduce prior knowledge on brain organization. For example, and that's sort of the first major principle of brain organization, the regional segregation. If we use this kind of biological compression, then we can actually bring down the very high and in fact arbitrary number of observations Remember the number of voxels, the number of vertices, that's not a property of the brain. It's something you decided during pre-processing. We can bring that down and just represent individual anatomy, individual connectomes on a much reduced scale by looking at a couple hundred of brain areas and doing so, we can actually start to predict individual phenotypes. I've made a bigger case on, on brain age, but in the end also showed you there's other phenotypes where this is working quite well, because now we do actually have a much better feature to sample ratio as we would have when we just look at the raw images. Now, regional segregation is only one part of brain organization. Uh, the other big principle, the guiding light of brain organization is networks. So regional segregation and interregional integration. And can we also bring in consolidated functional data? So we do have hundreds, thousands, 10,000 of neuroimaging studies. There virtually hasn't been a cognitive process that has not been studied many, many times in neuroimaging. That's good. The bad news is that neuroimaging is massively unreliable and unreplicable. There's a lot of different factors that play into that. The two most important one being experimental flexibility. So if you wanna test working memory, there are many different paradigms, many different uh, ways to operationalize them. So there may be hundreds of working memory studies but no two of them actually investigate working memory in the same way. And the other is analytical flexibility. Even if you have just a single data set, there are many, many different ways to analyze that. 
So we really have to state that the current functional neuroimaging literature is extremely noisy and unreplicable, but, and that's sort of the ray of hope, it's also really big and, and we take that for granted, but it's actually our biggest strengths. It's also highly standardized. From the late 80s, people have been doing analysis more or less the same way. In particular, they reported their results in more or less the same way, which is X, Y, Z coordinates of their local effects in the same reference systems since the late 80s, early 90s. So that means that we can now use the meta-analytical methods and try to consolidate that big but noisy literature. And what I show you here is the activations that are reported for working memory tasks. Uh, that's the meta-analysis we did well now almost 10 years ago. Um, at the time, we included about 200 fMRI studies on working memory. And as you can see from the picture, virtually any part of the brain has been reported as active in working memory studies. Now, if we actually model the convergence of these activations after accommodating spatial uncertainty, uh, you see what I just said even clearer. The, the probability of any voxel being reported active in working memory studies is really never zero. However, if we then pursue statistical inference against a null model of random spatial association, we can actually see that there are indeed a few regions of convergence. So these are the areas where across different experiments, cross centers, studies, populations, there was a convergence and hence, these are the regions where we feel that there's robust evidence for activation and working memory tasks. For those of you that want to dig deeper into the methods, there are some of the references at the bottom of the screen that describe the process in quite a bit of detail. What do meta-analysis allow us? On the one hand, they allow, as I just said, to perform robust inference. What are the things that really across different studies come up over and over again? And as I've shown here in two examples, we can even do that across, for example, many different mental disorders. What are the regions that in schizophrenia, bipolar, depression, and so on, uh, actually show a robust evidence for operations and patients with other cells controls? And that's mainly the insular uh, dorsal anterior cingulate system. What I find probably even more intriguing though is that meta-analysis can also reveal the absence of convergence. And I think the prime example here is really the study shown on the top left. Uh, Veronica Miller, a postdoc in our lab, she looked at more than 100 fMRI studies in major depression, both increase in activation, decrease, cognitive and effective tasks, and uh, thanks to a very concerned reviewer, uh, I think it's, it's up to 100 sub-analysis. Bottom line, nothing converges. You really have this 100, more than 100 fMRI studies in major depression, and there's just no robust convergent findings. So how do now meta-analysis inform, actually primary data analysis? How does it tie in into the narrative of individual prediction that I started and that I developed in this talk? Well, it's really a pipeline that goes from the big and noisy literature here on the left to the robust meta-analytical findings. And then we can actually conceptualize the peaks of that meta-analysis as the nodes of the relevant network. So what you see here on the bottom left are the, our best guess of the robust nodes of the working memory network. 
And then we can go to individual, for example, resting state data, and in a new subject that has not done any working memory task, we can extract the functional connectome of that one particular network. I have to admit something straight up here. We do not know, and in fact, we do not claim that this is really the location of the working memory network in that one individual. But it's our best guess of where the nodes of the relevant network are, given the meta-analysis over dozens, hundreds of studies, thousands of individual participants. So what we now have is for each subject, this kind of uh, network-based connectome, the connection strengths between all individual nodes of the working memory network. And then we can use these kind of networks again as features into machine learning algorithms in the very same way as I've shown for the structural imaging data. Here's one example. Uh, this is not the working memory, but actually the emotion processing network. And um, we then extracted per participant the connectome in that network and fed that into a machine learning algorithm with the question, can we predict personality traits in new subjects? And as you can see here, we can do that reasonably well. In fact, this demonstrates one of the big predicaments we, and with we, I mean the entire field are in. There's a, we can predict with R values of about 0 0.3, 0 0.4, maybe 0.5 for most traits, which is highly significant. And remember, since it's out of sample prediction, it really shows that we can make some individual inference. But there's also a long way from these kind of plots to something which is so precise and robust that we can actually deploy it in real life. Because remember, even a 0.7 correlation between true and predicted only means we explain 50% of the variance, which is not gonna help in a real life situation. So I'm kind of retreating again on the more basic neuroscience perspective. And what I've shown you over the last slides is that we can use meta-analysis to define network nodes. And we can define, in the, um, we can uh, train predictive models from the individual connectivity in that network to then predict functions. One of the things that you can easily ask, well, is it actually specific to a network? Can I not just extract anywhere the functional connectivity? Here's an example that addresses exactly that question. So we have two different brain networks. The cognitive action control network, very similar, by the way, to the working memory network, because it seems all to um, be variations of the multiple demand, and the social effective default network. For both of these networks, we can extract individual connectivity, resting state connectivity, and then we basically tried to predict individual cognitive performance. In this case, spatial working memory from the Corsi block tapping test based on these two networks. And what we see is that it does matter where you look. So you can actually predict individual cognitive performance quite well from the cognitive network, but you cannot predict it at all from the effective network. Here is a slight extension of that, where we now looked at whether or not, or to what degree, different brain networks allow a differentiation between Parkinson's patients and controls, that's the blue line, or schizophrenia patients and controls. And now I wanna take a step back and in more detail explain why that is so relevant. The key argument for the network-based analysis is that it would allow us to probe different functional systems 
based on a priori meta-analytical models. And we can always do that. But if there was no difference between the networks, if basically any network can predict any either cognitive or clinical phenotype similarly well, then that would mean that this whole idea of actually using different meta-analysis networks, likewise as probes into the individual function neuroanatomy would not hold. But as we can see, different networks indeed allow a quite good differentiation. And in particular, they show this differentiated pattern. Some networks are good at predicting schizophrenia, some good in detecting Parkinson, and vice versa. Come to my last sort of application example where we looked at schizophrenia, psychopathology. Um, this is a, the PUN, or these are the PUN scores, 30 items for about 10, uh, 2,000 different patients in the interest of time. I'm cutting a little bit short here. Basically, what we try to do is find a low rank representation of psychopathology. And we could show that a four factor model actually does capture symptom variability best. Now, for those of you who work in psychiatric imaging and psychiatric research, you are probably thinking like, so what? Another schizophrenia factor model. In some way you're right, but there are two key distinctions. Here, we actually looked for generalizability of the model. It's not just 2,000 patients, but it's 2,000 patients from more than 10 different sites around the world. And we did not optimize fit, but we optimized robustness, generalizability. These factors should capture new sites, new subjects as good as possible. And second, as you see on the left, the model is also sparse. That kind of refers back to Randy's uh, comment from a couple of minutes ago. And with a sparse model, we actually can enhance interpretability. In fact, we can see quite well that this model represents, uh, well, the first factor represents negative sy uh, sy symptoms, the second psychotic, affective, and cognitive. We then asked whether in that low rank space, we can actually differentiate different subgroups of patients and ended up with a two cluster solution. That was absolutely unsatisfying to the reviewer at the first journal where we sent it to because he just said, I know that clinically, it's boring. As a response, we ran dozens of additional analyses. In the end, it came out always in the same manner. There is just no robust evidence for more than two subgroups in schizophrenia. And these correspond quite well to the negative positive subtype. So if we look at, can we actually classify whether a patient is negative or positive subtype based on brain imaging data, again, using atlas-based compression, we can do that really quite well. And we can now also relate the top hits quite well to psychological functioning. As a final step, we then also looked at different networks. So this is the direct follow-up and the very same approach that I just showed for the personality prediction, for the Corsi block tapping prediction, for the distinction between schizophrenia or um, Parkinson's versus controls. But this time, we took a whole range of different networks and then ask, can we predict individual symptom severity along these four dimensions you see on the left based on the different networks? And that's the result. What do you see? You see a lot of gray. There's a lot of network by symptom or symptom dimension combinations that do not allow any meaningful prediction. There's a bunch of red. And then there are a few dark red top hits. And I guess most of you now think, oh, that's a big fishing expedition. And you're right, and I will actually revisit that part. For now, we just have a look at the top 
association or the top predictive model. So the best prediction was to use the extended social effective default mode network and then extract in schizophrenia patients individual connectivity in that network predicting cognitive disturbances. As you can see here, um, there is a fairly good relationship, 0 0.3, 0 0.3 after actually residualizing for a lot of confounding variables. For example, overall disease severity. If you do not residualize, you get much better predictions. Why? Because basically every model just picks up disease severity. But now I want to revisit that fishing expedition because indeed that's true. If we test 20 more, uh, different networks and four different uh, phenotypes, we probably get some good hit. So that's why we decided to take the six significant, conser conserv uh, conservatively significant um, as I say, um, relations and then go to a complete new data set, which is the BSNP data set uh, from the US. And the data set was only released after we've actually done all the analysis. And you see on the bottom here, uh, the six network by disease dimension or symptom dimension uh, pairs that were significant in our main analysis. And what you can see, it's only out of the six, two of them actually also survive um, or also generalize on these two new sites, and that's the relationship between the theory of mind network and cognitive performance, uh, cognitive symptoms, as well as the uh, ESAT network, and again, cognitive disturbances. The others, predicting negative, positive, or effective symptoms, they were good in our multi-site sample, but did not generalize to this completely new data set. As a last sort of add-on, we also then looked at a relationship to uh, receptor PET distributions and could show that load importance actually related to serotoninergic and the dopaminergic system. With that, um, at the end of my talk, and I hope over the last hour, I could show you, could motivate that mapping human brain organization, getting robust knowledge about areas and networks, modeling inter-individual variability in a predictive fashion. <coughs> so actually fitting models that try to map between brain and behavior and then testing that in new independent populations. And last but not least, moving towards personalized brain medicine are three tightly intertwined challenges, and we can, that's my very personal conviction, only succeed if we really see all three of these aspects in concert. And with that, I would like to thank all of you for the attention. Thank you again for the opportunity to speak here. Thanks to our funders, uh, but in particular, a big thanks to all members uh, of our team and the collaborators. Thanks a lot, and I'm obviously more than happy for questions. Um, thank you so much, Simon. Uh, so if anybody has a question, please um, send us a message or write something in the question and answer. Um, meanwhile, uh, since we don't see anything else, meanwhile, um, so maybe I can ask, uh, in that paper that you show uh, that doing um, meta-analysis, uh, no, there was no significance that survived on the Mueller paper. Uh, do you think that's because um, each study was different? Maybe the acquisitions were different, or the, or the approach of each analysis was different, like acquisition parameters or like methods for analyzing the data were different. Uh, what do you think it failed there? Or if, if you think it's just like um, the, the papers that were published were actually made yeah, at wrong? Least yeah, there are at least uh, two orthogonal aspects here. The one is inter in, um, experimental and analytical flexibility, probably adding into that in the clinical domain also uh, heterogeneity of patient populations. So basically, 
there are many different population samples, particular clinical population samples. There are many different tasks you can give them and there are many different ways you can analyze the data. And that's exactly the question that motivates the meta-analysis. Uh, is there something that is robust, that is convergent across populations, across tasks, across analysis methods? And at least here, the answer needs to be no. And there comes the second, uh, I said, somewhat orthogonal aspect into play. We do have a large bias in the literature in the sense that uh, neuroimaging null results are still a very rare kind. And that directly relates to analytical flexibility. If there's nothing coming out, you can try a different pipeline. Now that is usually not being seen as I try until I find something. It's usually more conceptualized as uh, probably that's the better way to model it. So I try it that way. Now this is a random search with early stopping in the sense that you basically more or less randomly search the space of analysis parameters but stop as soon as you find a significant finding and then write the paper. And what the meta-analysis have shown, and um, that is, I think, something one, one has to uh, take very critically, is that, for example, in the case of um, fMRI and depression, this has resulted in a big, in a vast literature with a lot of different findings being reported, but no convergence within that big literature. Thank you. We have uh, Rani. Uh. Well, so when, you, um, when you're working with your data and you're thinking about moving it towards clinical uh, applications, what are your thoughts regarding how to take all of the, the methods that you bring to bear and incorporating into them um, the work that people have done using other factors such as genomic or proteomic or clinical comorbidities, environmental factors, other things that may help uh, and explain some variance in the data and increase precision? The easy answer is yes, that must be the goal. Um, but the uh, longer and more tricky answer is uh, we are even on the imaging side alone massively underpowered. What we really would need is a big, a massive concerted effort for sharing and integrating data. Uh, the current pass with several dozen patients here, maybe a hundred patients here, two dozen here, just leads us nowhere. We would really need some form of a convergence, some form of a marketplace where anybody contributes their data. Um, and then we, in sum, could then reach the kind of um, populations, the kind of both representation of diversity and sample size that we really would need for this kind of analysis. Now, I realize obviously that Enigma is going on and I think Enigma is very laudable in many aspects, but Enigma is only moderately inclusive in the sense that it's from the outside often perceived as a closed club where uh, let's say a, a particular smaller psychiatric department in, in any hospital in Europe or in the US it doesn't really feel that they get a lot of, they can throw data in, but they don't get anything out. Uh, I think what we need, and the other thing is, there is obviously a lot of concerns about data privacy and frankly, reward. If you spend two years collecting your sample of 40 patients and 40 controls, uh, you just don't want to give it away for the greater good. You want something to come out of that. And, um, my feeling is, and part of our work is, that we do need a new infrastructure that allows for privacy protection, that allows for negotiated, negotiated sharing, that allows for distributed federated analysis. Um, I think that will come, 
Um, but my main feeling by now is that the challenge is more sociological than technical. Anybody else has a question? Um, yes, come here. Um, so, so my question is uh, just a follow-up of what you were just saying about this uh, infrastructure needed. So in terms of the, the, the methods used, like uh, for instance, you were talking about these uh, uh, learning approaches that you use to develop the models and then use new data to predict. Uh, I was wondering if there is any uh, such sort of thought of creating such an infrastructure such that uh, like the, the models that you use, um, I mean, not the outcomes of the models, but uh, like the, basically the code or something that you can use new features to feed into the same algorithm to compare uh, different uh, morphological or structural features to see how uh, babies can predict, uh, like for instance, the age as you were discussing, et cetera. Is there, is there such a infrastructure or a thought of creating or is it more important to have the data um, uh, as you were pointing out. Both is important and there's, uh, yes, there's a lot of thoughts and um, some initiatives in uh, creating this infrastructure. And I think that's going to be essential to so putting up models. But there is a little asterisk there that people often ignore. And that is that uh, really a lot of the data processing is also part of the model. So. Uh, really what we need is end-to-end is -end models that go from basically the raw data all the way to the actual prediction. So um, the, the actual processing, uh, let's say in the case of brain age that I showed, the VBM, the atlas compression and so on, is all part of that package. Uh, that's possible. Um, it, it's not always trivial, um, but it's, it's possible and, and, and we are definitely working on that. Um, so part of the answer is, I think we will see that increasingly over the next couple of years. Uh, the other part of the answer is, I am not quite convinced that we are at the level of really stable models yet. I mean, I'm seeing it in my, my own research. Um, it, it's really hardly, uh, as we go sort of through the iterations, uh, the next generation of PhD students, the next projects, it's really that we take an old model one by one but we always try to make them better because we know we are not yet at the optimum. And I think that will continue to be part of the process for the next couple of years, because honestly, I don't think we have the right models for most questions yet. Uh, thank you very much, Simon, for the clarification and the information thank and you. also for the very nice talk. Thanks. Thank you. So if no more, questions, um, just sort of from my side. I'm more than happy to also take questions post hoc as, as emails, um, schedule individual discussions if, if you like. Um, some just, just contact me, uh, very open to, to follow up offline, well, online, offline, so to speak. Thank you, right. Simon. Thank, thank you so much, Simon. Um, yeah, uh, okay, yes, yeah, so if, uh, if anybody wants to follow up with the discussion with Simon offline, uh, feel free to contact him, and if you don't find his email around, feel free to contact me and I'll put you in touch. Um, um, that's it, thank you so much for agreeing to do this frame up online, and uh, great talk. Um, Wonderful right. experience, thank you. Thank you. <laughs>